نستعينه ونستهديه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم ان زلزله الساعه شيء عظيم يا ايها الناس اتقوا الله حق توقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we all know this surah, this is a very short surah, every one of us knows this surah. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنْسَانِ لَفِي خُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ Considering that just two days ago Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed all of us, those who are here, to witness a new chapter in our life, the new year. Although as Muslims we do not celebrate New Year because we only have the two Eidain, the two Eid of the Fit and the Adha. And of course Jum'ah is considered to be one of the smaller Eid of our deen. So we do not celebrate any other holiday besides these two big Eid and the smaller Eid of Jum'ah. But although or regardless of whether we celebrate the new year or not, it is important that we still take the opportunity to reflect what this new year means for us as Muslims in our life, spiritually, what does it mean? And I do not mean that what it means as it means to the people who celebrate new year. For them, it's not really much something which is significant except that it is a night of fun. They go to Times Square, they watch the ball drop, and that's it couple of hours of fireworks, getting drunk, partying, and then it's over. They don't go to work that day, and they continue their life as normal. But as Muslims, we have a bigger purpose in life. So we cannot look at a new year as the way other people do. We cannot be as shallow as the people around us. So we have to give a deeper thought anytime something new happens, a new chapter of life. And to this, uh, to this effect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, Allah swears by time. As is time. Well, as by time, inna insana la fi khus, verily, mankind is in loss. They are in defeat. They are in a state of deficiency. Illa ladina amanu wa amal salihat, except those who believe wa amal salihat and have done righteous deeds. And they are persistent upon the truth and they are persistent upon patience. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of time. He is in essence time itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in hadith Qudsi al that I am time. Meaning our time is just an illusion. Our minutes and seconds, these are man-made. The real time is the one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all have watches, or I mean, we don't wear watches anymore. Some people do, but now we use our phone. We have our digital time. All of us have our own time. Usually this time, this digital time, is synchronized to the mobile service provider's time. So if you have T-Mobile, you're constantly synchronizing with T-Mobile server to get the time. If you're an AT&T subscriber, you will get your time from an AT&T base station. And so on and so forth. But before that, before the advent of smartphones, people use their analog watches, their wrist watches. And then came the issue of accuracy of time. Your watch may be one minute off, mine may be two minutes ahead, yours could be half a second, you know, one third of a second, or even ten minutes off. How will you know? So that's why scientists, they have something called an atomic clock, which they claim that it is the most accurate measurement of time. Through which, or 
by which all other clocks should be set. Using that as a reference, the atomic clock. I don't know the exact details of how it works, but they claim that that is the most accurate time. So this whole earth, they have an atomic clock that they claim is the central, most accurate form of measuring time. <clears throat> Likewise, we have our own time, and even that atomic clock time is really nothing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the concept of minutes, seconds, milliseconds, these are man-made for us to go throughout the day. So we can have a way of scheduling our lives. But to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thus really a new year to him begin at 11.59 and 59 seconds of Tuesday night. And then just because it flipped over one second, you see 12 o'clock midnight of Tuesday or 12 o'clock morning or Wednesday, you think, does it really mean a new year? Just uh, two days ago on CNN, I was reading an article, a funny article, they were talking about traveling back in time. And I do not mean the sense in which physicists, they're actually searching how to travel back in time and teleportation. No, they're talking about something else. So a flight took off from one area of the country where it was already the new year, two minutes into the new year, and their destination, when, where they will land and when they will land, it will be 10 minutes before the new year. So they will experience artificially New Year's twice. So they call that traveling back in time. It was just a catchy headline. Do you think that they really traveled back in time? No, they didn't travel back in time, but this is the headline, you know. Of course, the news guys, they don't really believe they travel back in time, but it's a nice catchy headline. But, did you really travel back in time? No. You cannot travel back in time. So it's a serial direction, one direction. So this time is a man-made thing. So if I decide, if the whole world decides that instead of Wednesday being the new year, today, at midnight, meaning Saturday morning, will be New Year. Then, you know, then Saturday midnight will be New Year. But we cannot decide that Jum'ah will be tomorrow. Just because the whole world decided that Jum'ah will be tomorrow, doesn't mean Jum'ah tomorrow. So that's the difference between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's time, way of measuring time, and our artificial illusion of time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this many times in the Quran, indirectly and directly, that our time, our sense of time is nothing but an illusion. It is a deception. So our 60 years, 70 years of life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could be not more than, you know, a millisecond or nanosecond of our own skill. That one day of our of one day of our measuring is like a thousand, uh, a thousand uh, years to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the scaling is different here. So we cannot get caught up in the artificial business of time. We cannot get caught up in the artificial celebration of New Year's. But regardless of whether we celebrate or not, what have we achieved in the past year? That is the question. In this message, we have a wide variety of ages, a wide age range. We have some people, Allah has given them a long life. May Allah continue to give them a long life and bless them in their long life. And some people are very young. I like to consider myself as someone who's young. Okay. So, we have a wide age range. Maybe 15 to 60, 65, maybe 25 to 70. Everyone is given an allotted time, an allocated time. And when that clock expires, when the ball drops, medical mode comes to knock on the door. I mean, he doesn't really knock, except for Rasulullah He was the only one who he was given the permission to seek Rasulullah's permission to take his soul. Medical mode will not give us that privilege but figuratively speaking, make a noble knock. Look around you and observe if you see today some people missing. And I do not mean they're missing simply because they're off today. 
but I mean that they're missing because they left. They were here last year, but they are not here this year. Look around you and you see, internalize if you can observe someone, some people missing. You can tell best because you attend the Jum'ah consistently. I can't because I come on a rare basis. Perhaps you, some of you will notice that there are some people who are not on top of the earth today, they are underneath. And what message does that give us? We have to take account of ourselves before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes our account. Now it should be a practice, an everyday practice, perhaps it's too much to ask nowadays, but in theory it should be a practice that every night before we sleep, we take an account of ourselves. You know when, if you own a business, before you close, you count how much money you made for the day. <coughs> they, they close the business from inside, they draw down the gates, open the cashier, and they lay out all the cash. And you have two, three people counting. Very fast. They do an account of how much they made for the day, or how much they lost. As human beings, we have to do the same thing. Because whether we do it to ourselves or not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is already doing it for us. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell us that it is enough for you to be a judge against your own selves. That you will be a judge against your own self. You know in court you have the prosecutor and then you have the defendant side. On that day you will be prosecuting your own self. You cannot be a defendant for yourself. You do not have a lawyer. You will be prosecuting your own self. You are the defendant, but you're also acting as a prosecutor. Read your book. Now, when I open my book, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us our books with our right hands. Because we know the people who get it from Allah, from behind their back, or Bishimani, by their left hand. It's game over. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned this in the Surah Al-Hakam. That the one who gets the book with his left hand, he will say, Ya laytani la puta kitabiya. I wish I was not given my book. Wa lam adri ma hisabiya. And I wish I did not know what my account was. And he will say, Ma aghna anni maliya. My wealth did not save me. Halaka anni sultaniya. My power. Those who are kings and, and prime ministers and presidents and vladims and dictators, their power will not save them. Halaka anni sultani. All the faraya, all the pharaohs that we see today, modern day pharaohs and dictators in the Muslim world, the vladim, the vladimin, the munafiqeen in charge, the hypocrites ruling the Muslim world, halaka anni sultani. They will all say, my power is not going to save me today. And what the angels say, take him into the hellfire and tie him up with chains. I mean, these chains are long. It's like 70 arm legs long. Why? He did not believe in Allah the Great. And our, our religion, subhanAllah, it's a comprehensive religion. That it's not just faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be a social citizen, a, a good citizen of moral standing. Why do I have to honor the Muslim? And he did not give the food to the poor. So today he will have no friend to save him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in Surah Al Mudathir that the people will say, We are not of those who pray. And they will also say, we did not feed the poor people. And they will, they said that they disbelieved in the day of judgment. They thought they will never come. You know, so when you live for <clears throat> a long time, you get used to this concept of years passing by, years passing by. But you don't realize, you know, when you're driving, you plan in advance which exit you're going to take. You don't wait till you're literally 20 feet away from the exit and you suddenly switch your lane. You can't. 
not at the speed you're going, 70, 80 miles per hour, the law will set the speed and break, uh, break the, the law. But at 80 miles per hour, suddenly shifting your lane or changing your lane just to get take an exit, it's not going to work. You have to plan in advance. You cannot do a sudden turn 20, 30 feet. Try that and see what happens. The people behind you or behind you will haunt. They'll get pissed because you did an unexpected sudden change of direction. So when we see that we are approaching the exit, none of us know what our exit is, but some of us get signs. The white hairs, using the cane, knee problems, blood pressure, cholesterol, heart problems. There are a lot of symptoms that indicate to you that, of course, young people get sick. But with natural progression of life, these illnesses come about. These are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you do not take heed at that time, then what else will you take heed? Now we have to take account of ourselves. What did we accomplish in the last year? Every year, we try to rack up our savings. And you try to accumulate as many vacation days as possible from your job. And certain types of vacation days, they don't roll over to the next year. So what you have to do, you have to basically spend it all before the year expires. You have to enjoy yourself before it expires. Otherwise, it doesn't roll over. You do not get credit for the next year. Right? And some, they do roll over to this year. So people, when they work throughout the year, their end game in their mind is always about December. And I want to have two weeks off in December. I want to take two weeks off straight and enjoy with the family. So what do they do? They work overtime. They work, they work, they work. They accumulate days and days and days. From January, meaning people, January just started for the next day. They're already thinking about December. Or well, they're already thinking about where they want to go over the summer. Right? They plan in advance, six months in advance, 12 months in advance. But these are the same people, they do not have the long-term planning for the Atho. These are the same people, they do not have the long-term planning for the Atho. Whereas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we must, what is a word of the khayr of Zahid taqwa that replenish your belongings, take good supply for the hereafter. Because you will have to wait for a very, very, very long time under the sun. And some people will be drowning in their sweat. Their sweat will be up to their ankles. Some people will be up to their knees. Some people will be up to here. Some people will be fully engulfed based on their sins. When the summer comes, do you think you can stand outside after Allah or after Jum'ah? Just five minutes under the sun without shade? No. And the sun is many millions of miles away, correct? And on that day, the sun will be on top of our head. How do you think we can survive that day? Do we have a long-term plan for that day? Like we plan for the new year, and we also plan for that day. When you want to go on a road trip, you pack up accordingly. It could be a three, four, five day long road trip. You visit many different cities throughout the country. San Francisco, go to Arizona, and you plan, and you plan, and you pack, and you pack. Why can't we not borrow this ideology, this preparation, for a five-day road trip, or a seven-day vacation uh, to Hawaii? Why can't we just apply the same thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Athena? Why? It's not that difficult. And we're intelligent enough to understand that concept, because you're applying that concept in the, in the dunya, right? So it's not that you're dumb. It's not that you're not intelligent that you don't know. You know, because you're smart. You did it for your vacation. But you're not doing it for Allah SWT. And Allah says about these people, They know the inside and the outside of the dunya, of the side. They know everything. <clears throat> you know, when you go to buy a car, the, the salesman, he will start rattling off all the different features for the car, practically memorizing. 
He knows the car inside out. Superficially, they know, but if you ask them the, the really nitty gritty details, they don't know. Okay? But if you go to a mechanic, a good mechanic, they will know everything about the car. Or at least they should. In theory, they should. If it's a V6, V8, or kind of combustion, kind of rear wheel, or, or automatic manual transmission, all these different things, they can tell you. They memorize it. They know the inside and the outside, like their name. We are likewise just as proficient about this life, about this dunya. But about the akhirah, Allah said, Allahumma and the akhirah can walk in but for the akhirah, they are completely uh, uh, unaware, ignorant. So what do you think is the nasir, is the result of these kinds of people? When they know so much about this life, they diverted or uh, they were deceived into spending most of the resources for this life. And they left nothing for the hereafter. Now I sincerely want to ask you, and of course we are not supposed to, you don't have to answer it, you shouldn't answer it. This is for yourself. Take stock of yourself, what did you achieve last year? And I do not mean what did you achieve for this life. If you got married, or if you bought a house, or you bought two cars, that's not the achievement that I'm asking. And that is not the achievement Allah cares about. Either. Allah will not ask about that achievement. So you see, our standards of achievement is different. Allah's standard of achievement, He looks at something else and we're looking at something else. And Allah SWT will judge us according to His protocols, not our protocols. The way we rank a person's success is how much money he makes, what are his benefits, <laughs> how many children he has, how many properties does he own, and not just that, where he owns them. You could own them in a very low neighborhood, it doesn't matter. But if you own even a small, dingy property in the city, you're a big shot. Because it costs millions of dollars. So it depends where. So you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives even half a cent's worth, half a cent worth to these things by how we rank ourselves? How will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rank us? That is the way you should do a step to yourself. How do the companions rank themselves? How did the companions rank themselves? And we like to th talk about the companions as if there's some fairy tale human beings that you know existed somewhere thousand million years ago and they had wings. You know, and there were angels flying around. And they didn't get hungry. They were real, tangible human beings like us. They were not no angels. They were not fairy tales, they are very real people. Real people. It's hard to grasp that concept because we do not see them. But if we were to see Abu Bakr or Umar or Aisha or Fatima they are real people made of dirt and they bleed like us, they sweat like us, they use the bathroom like us. So we like to distance ourselves from the Sahaba put them up to a level all the way there because you know why? It is, we make ourselves feel good and say, oh, they are Sahaba, we can never be like them. That is why we elevate them to such a high level. We make them look like they're angels. They are the most perfect after the Rasulullah But you cannot forget the humanistic aspect of them, which means the things which they achieved, we can also achieve. It's not impossible. Do not put them on a pedestal just because you're lazy to give the effort like they did. That's the motivation behind this kind of attitude towards the Sahaba. They like to put them all the way there because they don't want to be like them, that's why. Not because they really respect them, although they may respect them, but the main motivation is not out of respect. It's because they do not want to achieve what they achieve. They're too lazy. They do not want to give the effort. Now perhaps, I hate to admit that perhaps at this time of the Ummah, it would be very rare for anyone to come even close. That is realistic. But, it is what the, the effort that counts. You do not, you're not supposed to have a defeated mentality from the get-go. And that is an excuse that people use. We can't be like the Sahaba. Why? Why can't you? Show me where in the Quran it says you can't be like the Sahaba. 
Show me where in the hadith it came. You don't say that when you want to study uh, law, or, or you, don't want to, you don't say that when you want to go become a doctor. 10, 15 years of study, oh, I can't become a doctor, it's too hard. You never say that. So why you say that about being like a sahaba? Why you're lazy when it comes to uh, being like a sahaba, but you give so much more effort for something else? That shows, on a smaller scale, the nifa, the hypocrisy in your heart. The double standard, the two face of of your of your inner nature. And in the nafsala malakum misu, our soul is naturally inclined or commands us to do evil. Allah says so himself. Illa ma rahim Allah, Surah Yus. Except the one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has mercy on. So we have to keep this in mind. We have to monitor ourselves that if I'm giving this much effort for my career, for my family, for my child's education, some people, even before they have children, they're already saving up for their children's college education. Could you imagine that? They're already saving up 20, 30, you know these slush funds that they have? 30, 40 K, they're just like dumping in money, and they don't even have a single kid yet. But they're already planning for the kid's future. Meaning, in, in, if, if the kid goes to pre-K, or preschool uh, and kindergarten, you will have 13 years before going to college. It's already planning 13 plus years in advance. The amount of effort they put for that, why can't we see just a fraction of that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why? Not just as, we don't say give the whole amount of effort. We say just a fraction of that. If we gave just a fraction of that, this ummah will be in a much better situation than it is today. But none of us are willing to put in the sleepless nights, the sweaty days, spilling our blood, not physically spilling our blood, but figuratively. None of us are willing to put that kind of effort. But the Sahaba did. And that is why they are there, where we put them there, and we are down there. That is why they are there, and we are all the way down there. And the Sahaba, they competed not with how many kids they had. And you have to understand that their society was just like our society. They took honor in the amount of kids they had, their tribal lineage, their name, family name, right? And um, how much money they had, how many sons they had. They, they ranked each other, they looked at each other, they gauged each other's success the same way we do today. They were not any different. They didn't live in a society of angels and everybody's pious, no. They measured, compared each other with the same standards, more or less, that we do today. Maybe they looked at how many people have that specific type of red camel. Today we look at how many people has a Corvette or a Lambo or a Porsche. No difference. Just a technology change, time change. But the standard of comparison at the time was always the same. You know, because human beings, they are so shallow. Human beings measure each other, compete with each other with tangible, Perishable items. Perishable items. These are perishable items. This is how we compare. But after Islam changed them, all that became garbage, useless to them. They started shifting their way of thinking. They compared, they competed with each other with Sabiqun and Sabiqun. They competed with each other with how much money they can spend, how much blood they can spill for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much they can Sorrow for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of fasting. And we know that the sacrifice they put it is perhaps beyond a human capacity. They push themselves to the limit. You know when you max out the RPM of your car when you're driving, right? You max out the RPM, you cannot go any further. So what happens? It's not good for the engine continuously maxing out the RPM. You just hear it revving and revving and it's not getting any higher. And what's gonna happen? You're gonna end up damaging the transmission, right? So, they went to that level. At serious peril and harm to themselves to prove their worth to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this New Year's thing, we should try to connect that instead of just celebrating like everybody else, so shallow-minded, we should be sitting at home worried that one year has lapsed, elapsed with nothing to show for it. With nothing to show. Right? When you are studying, 
when you're studying, let's say you're doing your master's or your undergrad, or, and you pass one year of your studies, but you didn't take any classes. So did you really progress in your degree? No. That is a gap. In your hisab, your hisab, according to the school, the registrar, that is a gap. You spend one year, yes, but you have no results to show. So in essence, it's as if you never spent anything in that year. It's as if you're still didn't start school. This is how it looks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should be able to see that. Just a few days ago, <coughs> I got the news of one of my young cousins who is about, he just graduated, 22, 23 years old. He graduated just the past semester. And he got a job, he landed a new job. But the day before he was supposed to start the job, he died. Rahimahullah. And that was Tuesday. Tuesday around Mother. So a couple of hours before the New Year. So he was scheduled to start, um, matter of fact, uh, next week. So they gave him off for the, for the New Year or whatever. So he was supposed to start next week. But he didn't make it, did he? And I'm pretty sure he was happy, right? Anybody landing a new job? At the new year, it's a nice coincidence. It's a nice feeling. Because a lot of people, they graduate from school, but job opportunity is very minimal. Especially in this market, it's too much competition out there, too many people with degrees. Doesn't matter if you have a degree, now you need an open spot, right? And then if, when you have the open spot, then 50 people will interview for that same position. You know, so it's, it's tough. So imagine this, his joy and jubilance when he got the, uh, the acceptance letter. That, okay, we want you for the company. Start after the meeting. Are you sure he's happy? But did he make it? No. Allah had other plans for him. And we likewise have plans for the next year, for the year after that, for the year after that. How much money we have in our retirement, right? Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has his plans. But that is transparent to us because we don't see it. We do not see the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it happens, then we put our hand on our forehead and say, Oh my God, I should have seen this coming. Everything may be going fine in your family. And may Allah forbid and prevent this. Then suddenly you get the news that someone in your family has stage 4 cancer. Your life will flip upside down. Your life will flip upside down. It is one of the most difficult things to get a phone call in the middle of the day with such a drastic news like that. The death of someone, someone has been diagnosed with this illness and he has just a few weeks to live. These types of news, they flip a person's life. And this kind of news, if the person doesn't have Iman, they revolt against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If their Iman is not firm, if they do not have Allah bil Qadr, if they do not have pleasure with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree, they revolt in anger against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Why? Because they're planning and they're planning and they're planning, but they never took into account the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all. Why they never took into account the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because they don't give any importance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who gave it? Why are you celebrating? We do not celebrate, but to those who do celebrate the New Year, why are you celebrating New Year? Did you, of your own accord, do anything special that allowed you to live for the next year? You don't decide how long you live. Allah decided that you will see this new year. So what are you celebrating for? It's not, you're not living because of your own effort. It's because Allah decreed for you to live. So what are you celebrating for? Now if you got a promotion, I can understand that came from your own effort. And of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. You put in a lot of overtime, you, you impressed your boss, and you got the promotion. But what did you do to live until midnight Wednesday? 
What did you do? Did you do anything? No. So what are you celebrating? You see, people are so shallow, they cannot think. If you ask them, what are you celebrating? They, they don't know what they're celebrating. They're jumping up and down like animals. And that is a sign of their judgment. One guy does something, the whole flock follows. Blindly, they don't even know what they're doing. And their New Year's resolution is all shallow. Very shallow stuff. Shallow beyond belief. It's like some people can't think. A mu'min has to be much more deeper than that. Their New Year's resolutions should be about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next year, I decide that I'm going to read the whole tafsir. Or not even the whole thing, I'll just read the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah or something. So I can understand, I can internalize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to tell me in this book. Instead of reciting it like a parrot, without knowing what's going on in there. Or another New Year's resolution. I will memorize the 40 hadith of a Nawi. By the way, we should read up on the life of Nawi. Amazing. And he did not live for too long. He died somewhere in Allah in his 40s. But the amount of work, amount of books he published, we ourselves, by our standards, we would need 50 lifetimes to do the same work that he did. 50 lifetimes. And he died in 44. Around 44. SubhanAllah. And the amount of work he did. For the hadith of Rasulullah amazing. We should take a look at that. So we should have New Year's resolution which really matter. Not matter in terms of dunya, but matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course by extension matters to us because it is in our interest for our after. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us an understanding of the